I am thrilled to be able to welcome today to our lunch session, Carmen Tuli Ambar, the 15th president of Oberlin College and the first African-American leader in the college's history. She was appointed in May of 2017 after serving for nine years as the president of Cedar Crest College in Pennsylvania. Prior to that, she served at Douglas College at Rutgers and the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. President Ambar is firmly committed to the value of a liberal arts education and has made connecting her Oberlin students to the greater world a priority, most notably to our city of Cleveland as she encourages them to establish strong connections there. In addition to being a forward-thinking, strategic, and visionary leader in higher education, she is also the bold leader of her three teenage triplets. So President Ambar, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Marianne. The, the triplets just turned 13 a month ago, so I'm still getting used to that teenage space. So um, if you guys see me next time and I'm a little bit more haggard, you'll know that the teenage years have taken over my life. So this is my 22nd year in higher education. And um, as you heard, I've been at all types of institutions, sort of selective institutions like Princeton and Oberlin, state institutions like Rutgers, a small private, less selective institution like Cedar Crest. Uh, the higher education had been marching towards this um, disruption. Um, if you had caught me a year ago, I would have been talking about the disruption in higher education, comparing it to what the healthcare industry has been experiencing for the past 20 years or so. Higher education has been experiencing it for the past sort of 15 years or so. We've been marching towards it. Uh, and this is an accelerant, what we are experiencing right now in COVID-19. Uh, and if you um, ask me when I'm in the privacy of my own home talking about this issue, I've described it as an extinction level event for some institutions. That's how significant this is. So I'm happy to talk about all the reasons why. But what I thought I would do is take you back to March 11th of this year. Um, I, it's about 11 o'clock at night. Uh, we have been talking about COVID-19 for a bit um, in our country. Um, at Oberlin, because we have students from all over the world and all over the country, uh, we had had um, some issues around COVID-19 when our students came back um, in February. So we have a January term, so we're off all of January. So some of our students come back sort of later. So COVID-19 had been sort of absolutely talked about in China. Uh, we have about 12% international students and many of those students are from China. And so we had some discussions around that. Um, many of our Chinese students were wearing masks around campus. Uh, we had had some moments where we had to have our students um, be tested. Uh, and so we had started to get an inkling. By March 11th, I became really concerned about whether we were gonna be able to continue the academic year. And uh, because we're behind everyone else in terms of our schedule, a lot of students were already on spring break, but Oberlin wasn't. Um, and so I came in uh, the next day and I said to our leadership team, I think my exact words, my chief of staff is on this call. I think my exact words were, um, I think we're gonna have to shut this down guys. Uh, and um, you can imagine how that kind of goes over. <laughs> and um, so that was a Thursday. And um, so it was that Wednesday, so I come in on that Thursday and um, I said, I think we're gonna have to shut this down. And so there was a lot of discussion back and forth with another week of classes left. So the next week was gonna be another week before spring break. Uh, and I said, yeah, I think we're gonna have to do it now. Uh, and so we sent out a notice on that Thursday telling the campus that the last day of classes was Friday and that students had to be off campus by noon on Monday. Uh, we have 2,850 students on our campus. Uh, so you can imagine that that is a, just a, um, even now when I think about it, an incredible statement to make, to say in two days, you have to be off campus and you have to leave by noon. Uh, and so we went about all the things you can imagine that it takes to get 2,850 students off campus. Um, I think we ordered about 40,000 boxes um, had students come to what we call the root room, handed out boxes over the course of two days, uh, and literally helped students pack. Uh, and many students had to leave many of their belongings here, which you know still in their in their rooms. 
Um, and then we had, then we suspended classes for the next week. So we had classes that week, students were gone by um, noon, although we had a petition process where students could stay if they had to. Um, we probably have the highest numbers of students still on campus compared to our colleagues. We're probably about 250 students on campus because we have so many international students. Uh, and then we had a week of suspended classes, a week of spring break. And over those two weeks, we converted 500 courses to remote learning. Um, so uh, I basically have said about that, when you make a list of all the things we did in a kind of a four day period, um, it is it's incredible, the work that happened over that period of time. Um, to tell you some things that we did in the remote space before I get into the sort of impact in the future. So this is, we are a very traditional liberal arts college. Um, hardly any courses are taught in any remote format at all. I mean, I can count them on one hand. Uh, so this was a real shift for our community to kind of think about remote learning at all. Uh, and so for our faculty to translate 500 courses, and remember we have a conservatory as well. So we're talking about voice and cello and ensembles and orchestras. Uh, so it's a very different framework for that part of what we do. To try to convert that to a remote uh, um, learning is, is complicated, but we did it. Uh, and I would say about the experience um, now kind of having some reflection on it that um, it went as well as it could possibly go. And we are oftentimes in this format. Um, it exposed a certainly, um, uh, you know, issues of disparity, right, uh, for our students. And so some students go back to environments where it's very easy for them to come in this format. And some students go back to environments where they have siblings and parents that work and maybe not the best um, ability to, to connect. Um, so we had to send out hotspots um, for many of our students, provide laptops for students. So it was an undertaking to just try to create that framework. Uh, and the way that faculty have described it is that students who, um, uh, you know, most students have done fine, but for the students for whom this has been really challenging, it's been particularly challenging. Uh, we, we moved to um, sort of a pass-fail system that students could choose from. So we changed sort of our academic requirements a bit. Um, and then for things like our conservatory where students um, do recitals and all of those things, those things are being done by Zoom. So to say this is an upending, I think is to uh, diminish <laughs> kind of what happened in weeks, right? Um, and we ultimately ended up trying to, you know, the way I said to our team is, let's don't try to just duplicate what we do online. Let's try to do it differently than we do it because of this different format. So we created things like remote OBs, which is our student life experience, but online, right? So creating virtual hangouts for our students, opportunities for our clubs and organizations to get together, um, all sorts of, um, interesting games and connective moments for our students. Um, one really great one out of the conservatory is they created a Chopped, for those of you who may watch uh, Chopped, the cooking show. Uh, imagine doing that, but having to use uh, um, um, eight measures of a Beethoven um, you know, musical piece um, with a particular instrument that you chose. Uh, with a particular time and put that together to create a piece of music and then those things competed against each other for the person who formed the sort of best best piece. So that's the type of kind of creative way the conservatory sort of dealt with this change. Um, and we did our recruitment. Imagine doing recruitment for next year totally virtually. Nobody can visit campus. Nobody can have real sort of substantive conversations. So we created, we have this thing called uh, All Roads, where we call All Roads Lead to Oberlin. Um, and we, we changed it to All Links Lead to Oberlin. Um, and so imagine having a recruitment fair just like this, that you can go and click on to any academic department and to drop into their fair. So I want to drop into art history for 15 minutes. And then I go on to chemistry and I drop into that for 15 minutes. Um, all sorts of webinars that we did for students. Uh, we created a, um, a 15 module half semester courses 
um, newly created courses that have a focus on COVID-19 from a particular disciplinary perspective. We did that because we had all of these students who had their programs abroad canceled and had no academic framework to go to in the middle of the year, in the middle of a semester. So we created these half courses. And then the most unique thing I think we did was we created this COVID-19 course for our prospective students. Um, and this course was taught by a series of faculty members uh, that they would talk about COVID-19 from all sorts of perspectives. So they started out with the biology folks. Let's talk about it from the sort of medical perspective. Um, let's talk about it from um, a rhetoric and composition perspective. How is media thinking about this? Um, and we did that over several weeks. Um, each year we have about 810 students that come to Oberlin in the fall and 533 uh, prospective students signed up for this course. Uh, and 52% of them enrolled in Oberlin. So I, I thought we were creative in how we dealt with it. Um, but now I would say to you that the proof is in the pudding for next year. So if you wanna know what um, my life is like, um, it is a string of meetings and discussions like this that test our ability to open in the fall. And um, I was on CNN maybe four or five weeks ago and asked, talking about the same issue. And one of the things I said um, is that college campuses are like stationary cruise ships. Just to give you the framework of what we are by our nature congregate. That is what the setting is. Um, we have residence halls that have communal bathrooms. Uh, we sit and hang out together and talk together. We are in classrooms together. Uh, and so imagine trying to create the types of health protocols uh, that might be necessary to uh, mitigate for the spread of COVID-19 on a college campus. That is a tall order. And yet, um, to go completely remote uh, has all sorts of implications for the institution. Um, certainly there are implications for the delivery of this academic experience, right? We, we believe in gathering and connecting with each other through our student organizations, through our coursework, through our opera, through, you know, like Oberlin has um, 300 concerts a year on our campus because of our conservatory. Uh, so, um, you know, going remote is, is not the experience that we have, um, although we certainly have proven that we can do it. Um, I would say that if we were going remote from the beginning, that would have been a very different experience than the remote uh, framework that our students had doing it in the middle of the year. So they already knew each other, they were already connected, they already had a relationship with each other. And so the way that those courses went, built on these relationships that had, that had their foundation on campus, might be very different if we went remote. So. Um, here's our pillars. Here's how we're trying to think about it. And you've probably heard um, some colleges have already announced that they're going remote from the beginning. Some of the, some of the colleges out in California. Um, Notre Dame just announced, I think yesterday, that they're bringing people on campus. Um, the president of Brown, uh, Chris Paxson, um, if you haven't read her article in the New York Times about why colleges should be open in the fall, it's worth a read. Um, and we're having to uh, rethink ourselves. And um, so here are our pillars at Oberlin and then I'll, I'll open it up for, for questions. So first, we, the first thing we're talking about is, is healthcare strategies, right? So, so what does that look like to rethink? Um, it's things like apps that have people put in their symptoms every morning so we can be sim manage symptoms. Um, it, it means for Oberlin that we will likely not have our hotel open in next year so that we can use that uh, if we needed to quarantine um, students and if we need extra rooms, although there's not a lot of rooms in that hotel, about 65, but um, it means how do we deal with um, contagion, mitigation, quarantine, isolate, and respond as quickly as we can if we're going to be open. Um, how do we solve this testing issue? Um, it is the conundrum of higher education right now uh, because uh, most of us believe that we have to have some solution around testing. Um, how do you do it? How frequently do you do it? What are the resources that you need to pull that out? Are they going to be available for us to do it? 
Um, it is, if, the, if you ask me things that keep me awake at night the most, it is, it is a testing piece. Um, and then what does it mean to recondition our campus for a different way of being? We are not going to be, uh, operate how we operate, right? So we likely will not have our voice framework next year. We're probably not gonna do our operas. We're not going to do our concerts. Um, we are in the process of moving out furniture and making sure that you can't congregate. Uh, we will likely require people to wear masks uh, when they are on campus. And only if you're in your office by yourself will you not have to wear a mask. Uh, so imagine upending people's way of being while they're on campus, um, just like you see in stores, ways to walk, places you can't go. Um, enhanced cleaning schedules, all those things that go along with healthcare strategies. Um, I'm not sure what to say about athletics. Um, so the NCAA just said the other day, which we've been sort of laughing about because if you all have had any dealings with the NCAA, they literally dictate the socks that students can wear, right? And yet they've chosen to make no decision on sports, right? They've said that their lane is championship things is so they're not going to make any determinations about how athletics should happen. Uh, so that's just an interesting choice to make and it's to said that it's left to the presidents and to, to uh, individual institutions. Um, the next big issue that we're thinking about is how do we de-densify our campus? So um, for us that means, uh, you know, we have students in doubles and sometimes in triples. Uh, what does it mean to try to pull off singles and a place where we don't have, we only have 1,700 sort of individual beds and we have 2,850 students. So how might we do that uh, in order to make the campus less dense of students? That also means making our academic courses less dense. How do you, so we just did a, a little look around our campus. You know, we have a, a, a lecture hall that seats about 200 people that we use all the time. If you use the six feet protocol, it fits 30 people. So it means longer class days. It means class days on Saturday. Um, it means rethinking our class sort of periods. Um, it means doing things like for a large uh, lecture class that has labs, that maybe it would mean one faculty member would teach the large lecture on Zoom. And then the small labs would be for other faculty members to work with those students. There is no doubt that there will be some students who will be on campus, if we are open on campus, that will still have somewhat of a remote experience. They'll just be in their residence hall doing it because we're going to have to stagger it, right? The, third, the 10 of us go in and see the, the professor this day. We watch the lecture online, and then we switch the next week, right? So that's the type of things that we're thinking about, about de-densification. Um, and of course, the, the academic framework. The co-curricular experience, we've talked a little bit about it, but you know, how are we going to change, alter, encourage different behavior by 17, 18, 19, and 20 year olds? So that they um, are following the protocols that help keep our campus safe. Uh, and so what type of messaging and communication daily do we have to have to our students around the role that they have in keeping our campus safe and changing the culture? Um, and of course, what does it mean for our faculty and staff and students? Um, but mainly faculty and staff were more likely to be in risk categories, either because of age or other conditions, um, and certainly comp uh, compromised immune folks. So the last thing I'll talk about is the finances. Uh, I don't talk about it last because it's not important, it's critically important, but I talk about it last because I think those other issues drive what I'm gonna to say to you now. So uh, Obel is not unlike a lot of institutions. So if you just saw Bowdoin um, College in Maine, their president just issued a statement that said they're heading into the fall with a $20 million deficit that they know of. Um, that deficit is built around having to give refunds for housing and dining in the, the spring. Um, it's probably built around enrollment, right? So our enrollment numbers. Um, it's probably built around additional cost. Uh, and so uh, Obelin is sort of similar in that situation, sort of heading in with a, with a deficit that we can count on that's around 10 or $15 million. Um, and that's without expenditures. 
How are we gonna have different cleaning schedules? What does it mean to think about testing? Um, and so we happen to be uh, uh, blessed as an institution. So Bowdoin's endowment is about $1.7 billion. So I'd take that one. Um, but Oberlin's is, um, is, well, before this, uh, was getting close to a billion, um, on $950 million. Um, and so, yes, we're gonna make some operational cuts, absolutely. Most institutions are senior staff taking cuts, reducing 403B, all those things that you do. Um, and Oberlin was already in the place of doing some of those things anyway. Uh, but, uh, but we will be able to, to look at our endowment and to respond in some ways to this. Uh, but for a lot of institutions, as I said at the beginning, this is an extinction level event because they just don't have that framework. So if you follow Wells, a little small, used to be a women's college up in upstate New York, their president was just in, the, in higher ed saying that if they don't open in the fall, then they're closing permanently. And it's because of the tremendous financial impact that it has on families being able to afford the experience, which was already there, right? Um, the cost associated with these changes, the enrollment challenges that are there from the beginning, uh, and all of those things have come to a confluence to create this moment. So I'll end with this. Um, so I'm a big believer that in, in challenge, there is opportunity. And so what I said to our team about this is that um, there is opportunity. And in any kind of extinction level event, <laughs> there are institutions or organizations or individuals that come out of it stronger and better for it. And the question is, how can we leverage this really complicated experience to do that? So it means thinking about remote learning in a different way. Um, it means coming to a different framework about that. It may mean for us thinking about what it means to have um, more than two semesters. What might it mean to be a three semester institution and have academic programs that span all those semesters? Uh, what might it mean to partner in different ways with other organizations that was already a part of what was happening in higher education? So one of the things that I want to make sure we do is that, you know, sometimes when you're in a crisis or when you're in this really sort of intense experience, you cannot stop for a moment and look for the opportunity. And so what I'm pressing us to do as, a, as an organization is it is a crisis. It is. I mean, we have to accept that. Um, but there is opportunity, and let's don't lose the moment to find it even in the challenge. And um, that's the pressure of it. Uh, we have to make some decisions around opening or, or remote. I would say in the next four to six weeks, we're going to have to let our families know. Um, and in the meantime, we are feverishly working to put all the protocols in place that might be available to us uh, to be on campus. And so with that, I will stop and let you ask me anything you want. And I think I said to Nick at the beginning of this, he said to me, well, you're on this conversation, Carmen, because you're in the know. And what I said to him was, I'm in the mist. I'm not quite sure I'm in the know. <laughs> but that's all I can promise you, an answer from a person who's in the mist. Carmen, thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, we are definitely more informed about what's going on and it really is helpful for us to, to learn. So we've had a number of questions come in and for those who have questions, please put them in the chat and we're excited to get to those. Uh, one of the questions that came in talked about the value of student input on decisions on, especially at small liberal arts colleges, that that student input is really paramount to the students feeling like they've been heard. <clears throat> is there a way uh, that students have been involved in the, the decision making at Oberlin right now? Yeah, so we have a really active student senate that has sort of embraced their role in this remote way. So students were very active in helping us move towards um, the pass, no pass uh, uh, grading piece. Um, so they were very much active in that. They did a survey um, around remote learning and all the things that they felt went well and maybe didn't go as well this year. Um, that went to our academic committees. Um, they are involved in thinking about what um, 
the commencement framework should be. So we're gonna have a virtual ceremony. So we've tried to involve our students as much as we can. I will say this is a, um, you know, one of the challenges for our, all of our institutions is that we are not built for nimbleness. We're just not structurally built for nimbleness. And yet these types of moments require nimbleness. Uh, and so some of the things that we typically would do to get guidance and, you know, it, it, think about literally me walking in on a Thursday and saying, yeah, we've got to shut the college down. In a normal world, <laughs> I would never have walked in and said that without thinking what faculty committee has to know about this, what students do I have to talk to. Um, but so we find in a right balance, it's probably not going to be enough for, for our students or our faculty or our staff. Uh, but I think that we will find enough of a way for people to have input so that the experience will be enriched by their, by their knowledge. We had a, a couple of questions that relate to technology to know what are the, the platforms that Oberlin is using uh, to engage other things outside of just a, a Zoom. So are there tools that you've used? Um, and also, how can outside employers keep in touch with students remotely? Are there best practices for that? Yeah. So, you know, we have a lot of platforms that we use. Some of them are kind of the virtual platforms that we've used a lot. So for our alums and folks, we're using Handshake um, and we're using, um, I'm trying to think of the platform right now. I'll think of it in a moment, uh, where our students can make appointments with employers uh, and sort of have those types of resume opportunities with our employers. So some of those platforms we already had, um, and they're just sort of enhanced because of this Zoom experience that we're, uh, that we're engaged in. Um, you know, for some of our faculty members, they had already had kind of chat rooms and Blackboard and these areas where you could kind of create a virtual experience a little bit with students. Uh, and so that part has already been, you know, enhanced. I think that it'll be interesting to see what comes out of this. So, you know, one of the things I said about the recruiting process is that I don't think that we will not do everything we did virtually next year, even if people visit campus. So some of those strategies that we use to communicate virtually, um, we will use those next year uh, because we were able to connect in ways we never would have. Uh, and you know, we will want to connect with folks virtually, even if they can come on campus. And so I suspect that every strategy we use to recruit students during this COVID period, we will do that even though they can come on campus. I know we'll do the COVID, I know we'll do a course like that. So we're doing that course twice. We already did it. We're doing it again for the summer. Um, I'm sure we'll do build some other different type of course for next year. I'm sure we'll do the virtual hangouts and the text messaging out and all those ways that we did for students. We created in two days. We knew we were closing. We knew we were closing on that Friday between Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, because students were still on campus. I don't know how many videos and content we built in those three days. It was like incredible. But we had to, to build new tour opportunities, new looks at the institution, and we wanted to do it while students were still on campus because in a day they were gonna be gone. Uh, and so we used that content to send out in short snippets and text messages out around all sorts of interesting issues, and we will do that again. Wonderful. So one of the, the big pushes that you've made at Oberlin College is getting your students better connected to the city of Cleveland uh, and helping them, the students anchor there. Um, yeah. <clears throat> we had a question from one of our, our, your colleagues at Case Western who works in student engagement and civic engagement and getting her students connected to the city of Cleveland. So she's interested to know what are some of the thoughts that you all have had at Oberlin and strategies for still being able to connect your students to the city while yeah. maintaining social distancing and keeping everyone safe? Yeah, so, so we, we have this program called Connect Cleveland that, um, that began when I was here, uh, what, which what we typically did was we took the entire first year class during orientation. So imagine 800 students on all sorts of buses into Cleveland. And we took them at the beginning of the year for the day they worked and connected with organizations all across Cleveland and then came back to the center and had some fun. And that was kind of the kickoff to the Cleveland experience. Um, and then we had a week of Immerse Cleveland for some students. We uh, told students that they could find an internship in Cleveland, that we would get them transportation there. Um, and then we have these things that are kind of what we call community crawls, where faculty members take them through interesting communities over the course of time. 
And so, um, you know, we are trying to re rethink what we call career communities at Oberlin, which is also new, where students are connected to a particular area of study, maybe business finance and consultancy or education. Uh, and what we're going to try to do is to try to encourage students to make those connections with Cleveland employers um, and to give them a little stipend support to be able to do that. Um, sort of on a more individual basis because we don't think we're going to be able to do these large gatherings over the fall. Uh, and so it's really trying to take that career communities and trying to make it small enough for students to have these individual connections. That'll probably be the best we can do in this environment. Um, so we had to, uh, the, the career communities program guarantees the students who get admitted to it an internship for the summer, a paid internship. And our goal is to try to scale that up so that every student at Oberlin has that experience once. So this year we were planning to do 220 students have that experience this summer. We had to cancel all of those because no employers were really, you know, had the energy for an intern. Uh, so we're going to have to find a way to do something like that um, for employers that are open, um, but to try to make it this very sort of not universal experience, but individualize it in ways. Um, that's the tough one. That's going to be a loss for a little bit. We've had a couple of questions from uh, Oberlin parents that are yeah. uh, connected here. So, um, you know, or potential parents, it looks like. So looking forward into the next year, you know, what would you say to parents who are debating with their children about investing in what could be a, a very different liberal arts environment than what maybe the student had thought they were doing, as yeah. opposed to maybe going to uh, a community college or things like that first? Um, yeah. how, what, what would you address a parent say, who's considering that? Yeah, well, I think that one thing I would say is that we're all gonna have to accept the world's gonna be different. Right, so it's not just colleges that are going to be different. We're we're going we're entering a different world order for a while till there's a vaccine. Uh, and so, what you're investing in when you come to a place like Oakland is you're investing in the richness of the academic experience, right? The perspective of these faculty, um, and you're also invested in, as I say, oftentimes uh, one of the reasons to choose Oakland is because of the students who are here, the colleagues with whom you'll be able to engage with. So. Um, um, OBs are, are, um, are special. There's, there's a way of thinking uh, and being able to sharpen your wit off of people who um, are thinking about how to change the world for good in this particular framework is an important thing to be able to do. And so students will be able to do that. Um, and I also think that there will be um, some important aspects of the sort of college experience that will be able to happen on campus. We'll just have to be socially distanced. Uh, so I, I would say that it's still worth the investment. What I've said to folks about, about what's happened here, what people ask me, is this the end of small liberal arts colleges? Uh, we've learned some things that we can do differently, but we've also learned what we miss. We've also learned what we value. And um, we all feel differently about what it means to build relationship. We all feel differently about what it means to make connections. Uh, we feel differently about what it means to be together, to think together, to come together around a common mission. Uh, and so I do think there will be a space as we sort of get back to what I would call pre-COVID world, uh, where we are going to feel more excited about coming to a college campus and to small liberal arts colleges because of the residential experience, because of the connection. Um, so I would say the parents said, this is not the time to sort of pull back because a lot of the um, sort of social distance and all of those things will be existing on any campus that you go to. The question is, are you going to get the richness of the academic experience uh, that a place like Oberlin provides? And um, I would say that, that, that this institution has been around 187 years, um, and, and that's for a reason. It, it's been here because of how powerful it is as a transformative experience for students. We just celebrated uh, several virtual commencements across the country. Uh, and with COVID, the t job market may be a little bit tougher for those graduating seniors. Yeah. Uh, is there a, a message that you would send to those students? Uh, and also, what can Oberlin do to help those students get connected to employers? Oh, that's interesting. So I wish I, I, wish I had, had my list here that I could share of all the things we're doing to help our students sort of connect with employers. Um, so it's, you know, I haven't had to walk through this with some of our students. So we, um, 
So if you talk about the founding of Oberlin and the, and the complicated things that happen out of the founding of Oberlin, many of you know it's the first institution to admit students, black students. Um, 1918 pandemic, uh, the college closed down um, again. Um, World War I, World War II, Oberlin closed down during Kent State because Kent State students came to Oberlin's campus. Um, the National Guard showed up, was going to be arresting students and asking for information about Kent State students, so the college shut it down, um, even through 9-11. Um, so um, out of uncertainty, sometimes can come clarity and purposefulness. And what I've said to our students is that if you talk to alumni on Oberlin's campus who went through any of those complicated times, I've had a chance to talk to alums who were under World War II in Vietnam, um, they, that reshaped their world experience in a way that transformed how they thought about the work they would do in the world. So um, it's challenging for this group of students, these 2020 graduates. They're also going to be reshaped with a different purpose because of it. And so I don't want them to lose sight of that, even though it feels challenging, that they will come out different in positive ways because of the experience that they're having. Uh, and, and I think that that resilience um, that sort of sense of self and what's possible uh, and the role they might play in, in changing issues around the world that have come to the fore because of this pandemic uh, will serve them well in this market, right? And so we're doing all the things that you would think we would do uh, for students. So all the advising and appointments are all happening virtually. Um, they're having a chance to go to recruitment fairs virtually. So employers are still doing that work. Um, one of the things that we talk to our students a lot about is to not shy away from internships and other short-term opportunities that can give you rich experience. Uh, and so this is going to be the time to take advantage of those uh, and to do that work well. Uh, and then, of course, we have our alumni network that is working with intensity to try to connect our students with the right people. Yeah, we've been acutely aware of how our own mental health is being affected during this crisis. Uh, and we have read and heard from students and, or about college campuses that mental health is increasingly becoming uh, the role that college campuses have to help their students. Yeah. Um, how is Oberlin working through that currently with the students being remote? So we've been doing telemedicine appointments with our students. Um, so the same types of appointments that we would have done on campus, we're continuing those throughout this pandemic. I think that's been helpful to our students. Um, you know, Oberlin has um, always been a place that has had such a support system for these areas um, that we have um, more students who sort of take, uh, who access our disability services in other areas than, than many institutions. Um, so we've always been a, a place that students have found supportive. Um, I was just talking to um, David Hurst, our Chief of Staff today, though, to talk about uh, whether we might need to bring on someone around sort of healthcare issues on campus. Um, even though we don't have the resources to bring on someone new, I think for some of these areas, we're going to have to spend a, some resources to be supportive. Um, it's, it's certainly challenging, this environment, and I think our students are experiencing it. Um, but I will say that I've heard more than a number, <laughs> more than students you, you know, there's been a lot of students who have expressed how this has also recalibrated their priorities in good ways too. What's really important? What really is a crisis and what really isn't, right? What things are really the things that you need consultation on and what things can you do on your own? Uh, and so, you know, we've all had a good dose of that, I think, right? Uh, and, and I think that a lot of students have um, also recalibrated that piece of their thinking about the world. So we, some of our faculty members had students write um, some notes about what they learned through this process. Uh, and they're really beautiful, right? Some of the, but you know, the ones that strike me, a lot of the students who say, I'm capable of more than I thought I was capable of. I thought this was going to really be um, something that I couldn't handle, but I've discovered some things about myself that I didn't know. And um, if that's not what college is about, I'm not sure what it's about. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the Chronicle of Higher Ed talked recently that opening in the fall is a moral dilemma for colleges, mm -hmm. not just one uh, that is a medical or a safety dilemma. Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts on where it fits morally for the college to open this fall. 
You know, I think that's interesting. I mean, I've seen those articles and people have, have certainly sent them to me um, as people are want to do. Um, so, you know, I would describe it as everything has its nuances and everything has its complications, right? So uh, we, we always have a world in which there are risks associated with the work we do on a college campus, right? So we, we are not, not used to thinking about risk. This may be a deeper risk, a more profound risk, but we think about risk all the time. Um, literally 2,800, 17, 18, and 19, and 20 year olds show up every year on this campus. I can just tell you, if that's not risk, you've been on a college campus <laughs> in a long time. Uh, so the question really is, how do we balance that risk um, in a way that we can feel confident for our families and parents that we've done all that we could. Uh, and, and also knowing that people get a chance to make choices about the risk that they're willing to take, right? Um, and so we're trying to balance that from, from a perspective around health and, and all sorts of um, important um, you know, mitigating work that we can do. Um, and I will say this, although I'm not, I'm not a person who believes that um, the economics of this should drive the decision making. Uh, but let's talk about the economics of it for a moment in terms of a place like Oberlin and a, like a lot of small private colleges that are in small towns. So, um, you know, there are 1,100 or so people who work here at Oberlin, 1,100 families. Um, we are the anchor employer for this little region, for Lorraine County, and certainly for this town. Uh, so the fact that our students haven't been on campus uh, has hurt this region tremendously. Uh, it is not an insignificant decision. I'm not saying that you do it for finances, but it's not an insignificant decision to decide that you are not, you're gonna go remote for the rest of the year. And the reason why I say that is because if the notion is that there is no way to come back to a college campus unless you have a vaccine, then what you're really saying is that you're going to be closed this year and next year. Because we know that we're really not going to have a distributable <laughs> vaccine for hundreds of millions of people around the world in the fall of 21. So that's, that's the financial choice. Now you can decide that that still drives you to remote, uh, but um, for a lot of institutions, and I wouldn't exclude Oberlin for th from this, the financial framework of uh, remote for the next two years uh, means you start to, to ask whether the institution can exist. That, that's, that's the level of financial impact that that has. And so what I've said about this when people have asked me this particular question is that um, it's not that I'm saying that finances are more important than life and health and, and safety. I wouldn't suggest that at all. But I don't get to, as president of this institution, to not frame that choice as clearly for what it is. So we just know what we're deciding, right? That's what I said. Let's just know what we're deciding. You know, we can make whatever choice we want to make, but we just, we need to know what we're deciding. Uh, and so I think for a lot of colleges, they're going to have to put it in that framework, right? And figure out how to balance the risk and how to mitigate for those risks and how to make choices that seem rational and reasonable in a world in which the choices are complicated and difficult. And as I sometimes say on Oberlin campus, all we have is a sea of difficult choices. Like there's not, I wish I had one that was easy, but all of the choices in this sea are difficult. Um, and part of our job as leaders is to choose the, mo the one that has the most ability to assure the institution for years to come. Thank you. Uh, I want to end on one quick positive. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, what have you seen from your students during this that has inspired you? You know, um, it was, the, it was uh, right as the campus was closing, so two things. Uh, so we announced the campus was closing. Um, so students to stop by my office on that Friday, right? So they were going to have to be off campus in two days. Uh, what began to happen as that announcement was made was that there was these spontaneous gatherings 
just, you know, 30, 40, 50 students singing, cheering, laughing, just, just, I think trying to hold on to it, you know, for those last moments. And, um, these students came by and they were kind of, you know, they were looking in, should I go in? And, um, they, they were, you know, asking me whether there was any other way. Is there any other way for us to do this than, than, than to shut down? And they were so great because they're seniors. And, and they said, you know, because President Ambar, you don't understand, you get a chance to come back and be president next year. And we don't get a chance to come back and be seniors. Wanting me to understand, you know, what, what this meant to them. Um, and, and they asked me, you know, what are we supposed to make of this? And so what I said to them was that, and they were, happened to be students who were in the practicing arts. So for them not being on campus means not being in their studios, not, they're not going to have the same experience as the economic students going to have, right? They, they're not going to be able to do their work in the same way. Uh, and so we talked about what, what happens to college students when something significant in the world happens when you're on a college campus. And so I walked them through um, the alums that I talked to who were on campus when Kennedy was assassinated or Martin Luther King or Kent State or these kind of upending moments. And what we came out of that conversation with was this sense that they were going to try to find what was good about this what they could make of it that would be positive, even in the difficulty of it. And I've seen that through every student I've had a chance to interact with since then. So I've tried to drop in on classes, on Zoom classes, just like this to see what's going on with students. Um, you know, you could imagine the conservatory students are in this class where they're creating, um, um, they're creating sort of compositions. It's a tomorrow class, so it's technology and composition. Um, and every student that I engage with is making the best out of a complicated situation. And, um, you know, college is about a lot of things, right? And I say to students at every admissions event, great things will happen to you in college, but challenging things will happen to you as well. And the question is not so much how you respond to the great, but how do you respond to the challenge? And uh, what we've had is an opportunity for every one of our students to respond to challenge. And they've discovered a resilience that they didn't think they had before. And not that the pandemic is worth it, but that's going to serve them. It's going to serve them. And that's been the joy of it. President Amber, thank you so much for sharing with us today. We are thrilled to have had you. Uh, and you use the phrase uh, clarity and purpose. And I'm hoping that some of us got some of that today. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Marianne Crossley for our closing. Good yeah, to see you all. Thank you much, Nick. President Ambar, you were absolutely inspirational. Thank you so much. As you are making all these decisions in the midst of the mist, yes. we're so grateful that you took time uh, to be with us this afternoon, and we appreciate your honest insights. It's clear that you love your work, you love your students, you, and you love Oberlin, and all are richer because of that. 